Paul Show. Coming up, we are going to talk to John O'Shea, Kevin Kilban, and Kevin Doyle, who, as you'll know, have various things in common, including 13 years ago yesterday, 2007, they were involved in the Republic of Ireland 1, Wales nil. Not a noteworthy game, not a good game, except for the fact it took place at Crow Park, the first time the Republic of Ireland uh, played a match at Crow Park. It set a new attendance record for a football game in this country, 72,539 uh, watched the game. So we're going to get the memories of John O'Shea, Kevin Doyle and Kevin Coban about that day and indeed the campaign under Steve Staunton back for uh, Euro 2008 in a few moments. But first, we have Sean Kelly with us, former president of the GAA. You there, Sean? Yes, indeed. Delighted to be with you. Good man. And you're holed up and self-isolating somewhere, I presume? Yes, down here in Killarney. We came back from Europe over a week ago and we're not going back for some time. In actual fact, today we had a video conference with my group for about four hours and tomorrow, for the first time ever, we're voting uh, remotely on uh, an economic emergency package from the European Union which needs to be voted on by Parliament. I will be doing that tomorrow from uh, the uh, confines of our homes all over Europe. OK, very good. Let's uh, just remind people of Rule 42 and the effort, really, which was required to make Ireland against Wales and all those Six Nations games as well uh, possible. You became GA president in 2002. Was this a live issue then? Was this a big talking point when you took office? Or was it, was it only as it became apparent that Lansdowne Road was undergoing uh, redevelopment and potentially Irish international teams would have to play away uh, from Irish soil? We, when did this really come on your radar in a big way? It uh, really became an issue, I think, when firstly uh, the Crow Park was redeveloped, a huge stadium, and not uh, utilised very much over the course of a year. And also with the efforts by both the FAI and the RFU and indeed Bertie Hearn to build the Bertie Bowl out in Abbottstown. So people began to say, listen, uh, wouldn't Croke Park be useful in those situations and not to have uh, duplicate stadiums? And I think also people were beginning to say, uh, what's going to happen if Lansdowne Road is closed? Because the Bertie Bowl fell by the wayside. If I uh, proposals, they were also pulled in favour of the, the Bertie Ball. So with Lansdowne Road about to close, it became uh, a live issue that had to be dealt with pretty quickly if there was to be a positive resolution to it. Otherwise, if Lansdowne Road was closed and Ireland played their games abroad in 2007, 2008, I would say Croke Park and no GA grounds would ever be opened. So in terms of getting this over the line, what was the most offensive aspect to those who were against it? Because Muhammad Ali had fought at Crow Park, there had been rodeos I was reading earlier today at Crow Park, American football, various other sports had happened there. Is it that they were garrison games? Is it that in particular God Save the Queen would ring out on the pitch where Michael Hogan was shot? Was it a fear of promoting other sports? What was the most uh, cogent argument against this thing happening that you faced? I would say the most cogent argument was promoting other sports, as particularly field sports, as I put it, that were rivals of the GA, or competitors, the word they used to use, and that was rugby and soccer. The other events like Muhammad Ali and American football and concerts, they would not seem to be in competition with the GA. They were once-off events, so they were able to accommodate those. Which was a different matter when uh, your greatest competitors were now going to go into your finest grounds and use it as they saw it to promote their own game at the expense of the GA games. And that was probably the major debate, and that's where the emotion was spent. Obviously, you're right, historically, the killing of Michael Hogan and the raid on Croke Park 100 years ago, that also was a very significant factor because uh, that kind of emotion had lingered on, and there were those who weren't just pro-GA, but had to be pro but it had to be also anti soccer in particular, I think, maybe anti rugby as well. That was a kind of a thinking among some people at the time that had to be overcome, and thankfully it was eventually. What was the most difficult aspect of getting this thing over the line? I understand even just getting this debate into Congress initially was a really tricky uh, task. I mean, the, the, the machinations of how GEA politics work 
not something yeah. we have t- not something we have time for this evening. But I, I understand even just getting this thing in front of people to vote on was especially tricky. That's correct, because the other points we've just discussed were issues of debate on why or why it shouldn't uh, be opened. But in actually getting a motion to discuss it, that was the most difficult thing because at that time we had a committee mainly made up of ex-presidents who looked at the motions that came forward and they deemed them in order or out of order. And if they were out of order, they couldn't be discussed by Congress. And that happened to all the motions in relation to Croke Park, 2002 and 2003, when I was president. And I had to overcome that to ensure that they were on the agenda to be discussed in the first place. And I did that by calling a special Congress and changing the powers of the motions committee so that county boards and clubs if their motion was deemed out of order, they would be told where it was out of order and get an opportunity to resubmit it so the motions committee would have to come back and look at it again. Mm. And that's what we did in 2004. And it took the second meeting to get uh, some of the motions that were put forward on the agenda to be discussed to make the decision in 2005. Yes. Was there a moment for you which felt crucial or a moment of high drama or a time where you felt momentum was now behind you? No, actually, I was I was in trepidation that the momentum was going away from us, especially when I saw nearly all the other counties, uh, Cork vehemently going against it, and uh, even New York. So I said to myself, where are we going to get a two-thirds majority? Because I needed a two-thirds majority at that stage. But then other people came out in support of it, but at the same time, uh, you needed it a huge amount of support to get a two-thirds majority. Mm. And I was hoping that we could have uh, an open vote rather than a secret ballot. And when that uh, was dis- defeated at uh, Central Council the night before the Congress debate, many people felt it had no chance. But thankfully, that's not the way it worked out. Public opinion was very much behind you from memory. Yes, I think public opinion was. And also, as it showed, the clubs were. And if the clubs hadn't expressed their views, uh, I don't think many of the county boards would have actually voted in favour because what was one of the things I kind of asked? I said, look, I want all clubs to discuss not just this motion, but all motions to give their views. But of course, when they discussed it, they only discussed one motion. And when it came forward in the county board level, delegates had the backing of that club and they were able to stand up with courage and say, listen, my club is in favour of debating this in Croke Park and open Croke Park. And then also I think another factor which you just asked me about uh, was very significant. I remember one guy telling me that he was absolutely and vehemently against open Croke Park. But the week before the vote, he went out selling lotto tickets. And he said several houses, they went to send a lotto ticket. They said, if Croke Park isn't opened at Congress next week, don't come back to us again. And I think that message resonated with a lot of people because I think they realised, as you said, public support was behind it. And if the GA didn't move with it, then that they would probably suffer it a long time. Whereas if they went with it, they would get a lot of goodwill. And that's exactly what happened. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I grew up, I'm of a generation where, you know, the, things like the ban on playing foreign sports as it was back in the day was completely alien to me and just made no sense. I was not of that generation. I never saw the GA as a political institution growing up. I grew up playing GEA and soccer. That was the most natural thing in the world uh, to me. And in 07 or in 05, I suppose, when the Congress voted on this, if the GEA had said no and if the Republic of Ireland and the Irish rugby team had been forced to travel to the UK to play matches, I mean, I personally would have taken a hugely dim view of the GEA and for a very long time as well. And maybe some people in the GEA didn't actually realise potentially what they were risking if they had voted no. Yeah, I think that's a major point. And I know in myself, when I kind of took on those who were against it and uh, stuck my neck out, especially uh, against uh, the powers that be at the time, it was really for that. I said to myself, it is absolutely imperative to me that an Irish team uh, made up of Irish people wearing the green jersey of Ireland would have to play their home games in uh, Twickenham or in Cardiff or wherever when uh, we have a great stadium that uh, we just wouldn't give to them to allow them to play their games there. It just was something that I said, you can't accept that and you have to do everything you can mm. to try and ensure that doesn't happen. And thankfully, we were able to uh, 
convince enough people to do it. I remember one fellow at uh, Congress summarised it very well, and I think it was significant in changing the tone of the debate when we debated in Congress in Croke Park 2005. <clears throat> he was Sean Quick from Wexford, and he said, sure, if your neighbour had a, a house went on fire and you had a spare room, wouldn't you give it to him while he's getting alternative accommodation? And I think it was a very simple but very appropriate analogy, and that struck a chord with people, I think, and that was significant. Two last very quick questions. Were there many contributions at Congress? Because we've seen major rule changes happen even just a couple of months ago, and nobody said a word. I think the uh, not passing back to the goalkeeper motion, for instance, had no contributions from the floor. Was this uh, full of contributions and full of grandstanding and lots of speeches that day back in April '05? I'd have to say that it was by far and away the best uh, debate I ever attended, possibly not just in the GA, but even politically as well, because the debate went on for uh, two hours, I think. I chaired it. I gave everyone an opportunity to speak. I had a rule that nobody could speak uh, twice, which I uh, abided by, and that caused offence to one ex-president who wanted to come in a second time, and I didn't allow it. But uh, the debate was fantastic, to and fro. Everybody was sincere. It was uh, logical, it was emotional, but uh, nobody really went out of hand in terms of insulting anyone or anything like that. And uh, definitely it is one of the standout moments. And I think the debate itself, because of its maturity mm. uh, and a particular decision taken when uh, almost 70%, I think, of people voted in favour of opening Croke Park in a secret ballot, I showed, I think, the wonderful democratic organisation the GA really is and that he could take decisions even unpalatable to some people mm. when the time needed it. Yeah and a last one then because it was the right decision I think at the time and it has certainly aged very well. <laughs> that's not to, as, and, and you haven't done this, that's not to ignore how strongly other people felt about it. Like I saw the Barrett family in Kerry they withdrew All-Ireland medals from the museum at Crow Park in, in just uh, disgust at the whole thing. Do you meet many people now who say to you, come here, Kelly, you got that all wrong? Uh, not one, but not as many as before. Uh, I suppose, unfortunately, some of them might have passed away. But I know in the immediate aftermath, for four or five years, you would meet uh, real diehard GA people whose commitment was totally and only to the GA and would say to me, you're the so-and-so that left the Anglo-Saxons into Crow Park. We don't want anything to do with you. But they were few and far between. But one of the most uh, enjoyable, enjoyable moments I had was after Crow Park was opened, maybe two or three years afterwards, I met uh, an official from Tyrone who were totally against the opening of Crow Park. And I remember he said to me, he said, Sean, he said, I want to thank you. We got it wrong. You got it right. And we apologise for a lot of the hurt we caused you at the time. I thought that was fantastic. And it just shows you the real spirit of those behind it. They were just totally committed to Jay and they could probably see nothing else. And they were probably our best supporters in many regards. Mm. But thankfully, I think they've all come on board now and seen that the sport is bigger than just one organisation and that we can all help one another and that we aren't really uh, rivals at all. We're all there doing the same thing, promoting sport for the good of our young people. Sean Kelly, former GA president. Thanks, Sean. Much appreciated. You're most welcome. And best look with the book. A great job. Thank Thanks you. very much. That's Sean Kelly there. Short ad break, then we're back with John O'Shea, Kevin Doyle and Kevin Colban, who played football in that first game. On Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. The greatest football partnership since Shearer and Owen.
Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power The greatest football partnership since Jeff and Heskey Now you're very welcome back So let's check in with uh, one of our next guests Kevin Kilban, you're there, hello Hi Joe, how are you keeping? How are you keeping? Where are you in the world at the moment? I'm very good. I'm in Canada. I'm, uh, I'd like to say stuck in Canada, but I'm hardly stuck here. But yeah, it's all good. Everything's good. What's the situation over there? How serious is it? Pretty much the same. Everything, yeah. No travel, no, uh, you know, obviously social distancing, everything the same as what it is what it is over there in Ireland. Can't get out much, just uh, chilling out in the house. So there's not much to do really, yeah. So it's all good. It is incredibly surreal right now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's just, it's, oh, it's, it's strange times and all, everything just... It just seems so strange that obviously you're in the house so much and you watch all you the first thing you do is watching sport. All I've been doing is watching reruns of I'm watching all sorts of golf tournaments in the last six or seven years here as well, watching NFL, all the all the stuff that the all the American US sports over here, that's the sort of stuff I've been watching because there's there's nothing to, to watch when you're stuck in the house as well. It's just it is incredible times, strange times and let's just hope that uh, we get back to normality soon enough, I suppose, yeah. I thought you were going to say, the fr oh, you're sitting in the house and all you're watching is the news. That's what I thought you were going to say, but all you're watching is sports, so you're grand. Oh, I've watched loads of, loads of the news as well, you know, you're watching all the news and everything like that. But I've been watching reruns. I was watching one this morning, you probably you know, with the, with the, uh, the golf pod you do. Uh, it was, I think it was Tiger's when he, Tiger when he, he, in his comeback a couple of years ago, the Vesper, is it the Vesper Open when... Paul Casey won, Tiger finished second. And it was just good to watch it. Tiger just, just literally missing out. But that was the start of the comeback before he went on to win the Masters, what, a year later or so. So it's good fun. The Valspar, maybe, is it? Valspar, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, I, I can't remember. But it was it good. Really it was good. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You, you, you should know this sort of thing, Joe. Anyway, before I say, before we start as well, Joe, I heard you before you were speaking to Sean Kelly there to say that the game that we're on to talk about, the game at Croke Park, wasn't noteworthy and wasn't very good at any time. I mean, it was very noteworthy, first of all, but do you, did you actually watch the game? Yeah, I do remember. I actually remember watching that game because it was so poor. Yeah. Well, knowing, knowing you, Joe, I've never seen you actually watching a game fully, so to come back at me and say that, you know, or, or saying that to, to, to our listeners and our viewers, then I, know, I don't know. I just, I just have my reservations about where you're coming from sometimes. Have you, have you watched it back? Have you watched it back recently? I'll go with the Guardian's take on it. How about that? Ireland will go be glad of the three points. This is a neutral observer here. Ireland will be right, glad of the okay. three points when they take on Slovakia here on Wednesday, while yeah. Wales will argue that their games in hand could still rescue them. But the crowd who witnessed a dour encounter might just hope it's another 106 years until football is played at Crow Park. Okay. An occasion okay. that promised to be rousing and passionate proved ultimately to be bland and moribund, which I think means at the point of death. So I'm not alone in thinking it wasn't a classic. Kev. Well, okay, you're going with the Guardian now, but I was going with with you. Or, I went, I went, I'm going so. neutral, neutral I, observer. I, I'd, I'd want to ask you what you actually remember. What, what, what do you remember from the game, Joel? That's I tell you, what I, I remember. Know. I tell you, I remember. I remember honestly thinking this Stephen Ireland kid is going to be a phenomenon for the next ten years. Yeah, yeah, he was a nice quality footballer, wasn't he? he? Scored a good goal that that day, didn't a he? Really as well, good so goal. yeah, it, um, yeah, really good just goal. Just wasn't to be. No, uh, let's bring in Kevin Doyle. Hi, Kevin. How you doing, Joe? So I presume you're not taking it personally that I'm not trying to pretend that Ireland won Wales nil uh, wasn't a classic. I I watched it as well actually. I was I was injured leading up to it with a bad hamstring injury and I just got back fit the week before. So I was on the bench. It was a close run thing whether I was going to start or not. And um, I think Stan wanted to play one up front anyway. So I think that sort of made up his mind and he didn't play me. But. Uh, yeah, vaguely, like you, Stephen Ireland, thinking Stephen Ireland was class. Um, first time I thought, you know, really sprang to my mind, thinking this guy could be a superstar. Um, but other than that, yeah, don't remember anything from the game. Remember the build-up a bit, the noise, the crowd looking around. But yeah, it wasn't. It mustn't have been a classic. I can't, can't remember much about it. Right, Kev, you can apologise or we can move on. It's up to you. Oh, I'm not apologising. I'm just saying you're, you're stating it as a fact, Joe. I know, I know you. You don't really watch football too much, so... That, that's all I'm going on, really. I'm going on my personal experience of knowing you for quite a while. Right, OK. This is a strange um, line to take. I, yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. So, anyway, um, the team was given O'Shea, McShane, Dunn, Finnan. We had Stephen Ireland, we had Carsley, we had Kilban out there, we had Duff, we had Keane. McGeady came off the bench as well. I don't think you... Came off. The, oh, you did, Kevin. You came on for Stephen yeah. Ireland actually after an hour or so. Wales had a decent team in some respects. Bellamy was up front. They had gigs as well. 
uh, John Toshak was the manager. Just on the Crow Park front, Kevin, was this a big thing for you to have an Ireland match at Crow Park? Had you been, you know, you, I think, yeah, pretty sure uh, you've been a GA man growing up as well. Well, yeah, uh, you know, um, in the build up to it, there was a thing. My cousin was going to be playing Camogie there, Camogie, uh, Camogie Leinster final, Camogie All Ireland final, I'm not sure. For Wexford, um, so there was a thing about that. My mother played Camogie there for Wexford. My father played under 21 hurling there for Wexford, I think. So um, there was a bit about it leading up to it. All my aunties, I, I have nine aunties, nine sisters, and they all played there, I think, at one stage or another, played Camogie for Wexford. So right. there's a bit of a thing about it. Um, that I've been there for Wexford when the all Ireland hurling final. I had a piece of grass that I put in my pocket that I put in a jar when I was 10, when I got home, or 10 or 11. And... Um, I still have it at home from the Wexford win the All Ireland final against Limerick. Um, wow. did not, I didn't know at the time that would be the last time they won it, but um, as an 11 year old or whatever, uh, took a piece of turf put in my pocket, I was in his 16 that day and brought home. So I still have that. So it was a bit, yeah, I, you know, I didn't, like, Land's Own Road was, was, you know, the home of sport for me, sort of that feeling. Um, mm. But Crow Park was a close second. And it always, now, People forget about it, sort of, to say, oh, you never got to play in Crow Park. I can just say, well, actually, I did, lads. <laughs> got there. You've forgotten about that one. But um, it's nice to be able to say that. But other than that, I didn't have a massive longing for it. I saw a new once, once I was playing, I was playing, playing football, I would never get the chance to, to go there and play. So, mm. but it's a nice, and this is a nice little bonus. Fantastic stadium. But the, going on, actual day there, when you were playing, I, I started the game a few days there against Slovakia. Like the atmosphere for a football match wasn't great. It was no. too far from the action. You couldn't see the the touch lines. It was such a, a amount of space between of grass between the sidelines, the end line, and, and the actual stand. It, it wasn't an actual great place. You know, it's people probably don't want me to hear me say that it wasn't a great place to actually play. No, I I, I would share that. I wasn't at that Wales game. I was at the one all draw against Cyprus, the October. I think it was the last game, and I was behind the goal, and yeah. even the gap from stand yeah. to the goal was huge. I mean, it's dwarfed. I mean, we saw it even with the Lee Miller uh, testimonial, just a GAA pitch versus a, yeah. a soccer pitch. So it didn't actually lend itself to a great atmosphere ever, I found. No, it was more. No, it didn't. And we didn't. I think we did. We beat Slovakia there, that and the, the one away. I know. I, there, was the two, there was the two all, I don't know. two all draw away where you scored that brilliant goal, actually. Yeah. Yeah, but I scored a header against Slovakia, that one in Crow Park. Um, the one a few nights after the Wales game. I don't know if we won that one or you not. You did, actually. Yeah, you got six points, actually. So, I mean, you started... Okay. That, that kind of turned the campaign around because <laughs> yeah, you beat Wales along, and then you beat Slovakia. Yeah, uh, We're going along fine in the group. Um, but I don't remember us putting... Obviously, that's Slovakia game, so I don't remember us putting in great performances in Crow Park. Um, it was just a nice historical thing. Fantastic yeah. that was opened up to us. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, the majority of people were, were delighted that it could go ahead and that, you know, we were getting over all differences and we were moving on in the country and, um, you know, and that was it, you know, I hope otherwise, I don't think our form was anything fantastic there. I said the atmosphere wasn't brilliant. It was just a significant event in the country's history that we got to play the rugby, rugby team, I think, the week before we got to play there. They had, yeah. Uh, and I think it's right that we moved on. We, we don't need to use it now. I don't think it should be opened up. It should, should be kept it's the GA's home, it's the GA's ground. It should be kept in the way it is now. It works works perfect. I think John O'Shea is with us as well. Can you hear us, John? Hey, my man, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we've got you loud and clear. So Crow Park for you, was that a big deal? You, you'd been a GA fan growing up? Yeah, well, look, I was I was, uh, I was, was brought up many a times watching Kilkenny because my dad was a Kilkenny man and my granddad. Um, so I was, I was there quite a bit when I was younger. And then I, I got to go a couple of times with Waterford, but not the, uh, not not as many as I did with Kilkenny when I was growing up. But um, no, it was, it was one of them things. I think the games, the games at Crow Park, what they were great in the sense of yeah, you got to play at Crow Park. But as you were just saying there, as, as Kevin was saying, the atmosphere uh, didn't lend itself to a to a, to a fo football atmosphere. And um, I think it's different too. If we had been playing like the like the rugby lads were playing England. Yeah. If we hadn't been playing England, for example, it would have lent itself naturally to a to a lot more of a, a lot more of an atmosphere. The fact we were playing Wales, I don't think it had the same impact. No, it probably didn't have the same bite. Uh, Kevin Kilban, it's probably the two Kevins on the line. It's just probably unfortunate that the period at Crow Park coincided with the tough period that was the Steve Staunton era. Like the rugby fans can always remember. Ireland beating England, Shane Horgan's catch, all of that. Whereas 
there's no real standout performance or standout evening that everybody instantly remembers mm. from the Crow Park days. I think I think the standout game was probably the Italy game where we actually did draw the game. We probably should have won the match um, that evening against Italy when we'd scored. Sean St. Ledger, I think, scored later on and then they went up the other end and got the equaliser. That was probably the standout game. We had a decent campaign, I feel, under um, under Giovanni Trapattoni during the, the spell after after Stan. Mm. Uh, it went quite well. But I think, yeah, in terms of standout games, no, we, did, we didn't really have any standout huge result alert. for me personally I, I got me I made me 100th appearance my 100th cap against I think it was Montenegro that night um, so that's a, that was obviously a huge milestone for me and one one I'll never forget and I think I for me personally I think I was delighted that actually my 100th cap did come at Croke Park because it, it you know what 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 the GA has meant to my family over the years mm. as well so that certainly meant a lot to me and I was delighted that you know, of course, that that, that, that uh, huge milestone for me happened um, happened at Crow Park. Absolutely. And had you been there before you played there, Kev? No, I'd never. I'd I'd been to watch. I'd been to watch games, yeah. Uh, okay. But I'd never. I'd never. Obviously, never stepped foot on the turf or anything like that. I went probably. It's about ninety seven. I think the first year I went there uh, was it ninety seven. I think that's when. Oh, was that was that was Mayo final? Was it ninety seven? I think yeah. it was about 97, 90, 97 or ninety eight. Certainly, when I when I came around the senior side, I went to I went to one of the All Ireland finals. Then. Yeah, they played Kerry in ninety uh, seven. Ninety seven, it was yeah, yeah. ninety seven. That was the first that was the first time I was in Crow Park. Yeah, so yeah, and of course, over the years since, I've managed to have been back a good few times. But I, I, I'm I'm I think everyone fully understand understands a lot of the a lot of the British born lads wouldn't have known the this the significance of of playing the stadium. We were probably all made more uh, more than aware of it in the lead up to the game and what it meant to everybody. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of the lads wouldn't have been aware of the of the huge significance and the history around the stadium. No, I was just looking back, John, at that campaign, uh, doing a bit of reading this afternoon, and you kind of forget Ireland actually finished third in that group for Euro two thousand and eight. I mean, the the Staunton era is is remembered for, I guess, the Cyprus loss, the five two loss, and the last minute winner, Stephen Ireland again against uh, San Marino. But actually, you know, Czech Republic, Germany, two very good sides. And then Ireland finished ahead of Slovakia, ahead of Wales, ahead of Cyprus. So, you know, on paper, it wasn't um, disastrous. And yet, right throughout that whole campaign, it never seemed to be uh, quite working. Like, even in the build-up to this Wales game that we're marking the anniversary of, you're, you're just off the back there of the 5-2 loss to Cyprus. So even then, even that early in the campaign, there was a lot of kind of pressure on the team. Yeah, there definitely was, but I think that it was the fact that the Cyprus one, the Cyprus game in particular, obviously just seemed to bring such a, and rightly so, such a kind of a negative impact um, around everything to do with the team. But then, as you said, not only the, the qualifying results, I remember we, I'm sure it was Stan in charge when we, we we beat Sweden comfortably in a friendly. Yeah, the first game. We beat, yeah, we beat Denmark away comfortably in a friendly. I'm sure Stan was in charge for that too. Right. And to think like those those teams when we were just dealing with them comfortably, as you said, that there was some positives around that time too as well, you know. But unfortunately, we didn't we didn't qualify, and ultimately that's that's what the managers are are judged upon. Kevin Doyle, what was your sense of how things were under Stan around that time, off the back of the 5-2 loss, which is tough to come back from in the yeah. eyes of the public and as a group and then into the Wales game? Did it ever feel like you were on the right track and moving in the right direction or was something always a touch off? Um, it seemed really, really positive to begin with. Obviously, my first my first um, start for him was that Sweden game, which was... Stan's first game in charge. Um, everything was very positive. We won 3-0 and a fantastic football. And we started the group, you know, everyone was positive about a new beginning and we Sir Bobby along with Stan as well. Um, mm. And that Cyprus game, I was out there and I failed a fitness test in the warm-up or that morning or something. And I remember being devastated thinking we're going we're gonna to batter Cyprus here and I had a good chance of scoring a few goals maybe. And I was so disappointed to fail the fitness test and sitting in the stand. And um, as John said, that was it, that game. 5-2, you know, we couldn't have been dreamed of. Ireland had been so successful for a long time and this was the first time we'd really been turned over and turned over convincingly by any sort of so-called minnow. Um, I remember flying, we flew to Dublin straight from the game, flew straight back to Dublin and getting in and the morning papers were out and I'll never forget the front page, I, I'm not sure which one the Irish papers, but it was just a picture of the starting eleven and it, the, the headline and nothing else in the page. The headline said, wanted for crimes against Irish football. And it just, I just don't think we ever recovered for that. From from that, it was massively on the back foot. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it, there was so much things going on around the train, you know, training around the emphasis, you know, there was, I can't remember, there was clowns or something being sent to the training ground to try getting a picture with Stan and, and stuff like that. And it just brought this really, you know, sort of a, you know, I don't know, like like they were trying to take the piss out of us all yeah. the time or take the piss out of Stan. It was hard to recover from it. And we, and we didn't, even though when you look at some of those results, you take a lot of those now, fantastic performances. Um, and it's a really tough group, actually, when you, you just named out those teams I'd forgotten. It was a, it was a tough, tough group. It, it, yeah, it was. To, like, to finish third there is not a disgrace, and yet that's almost kind of how yeah. that era is uh, remembered, really. And I saw one of the other paper headlines. Again, I'm not actually sure which paper it was, but after the 2-1 win over San Marino, the headline was Minnows won Muppets too. You know, like yeah. it was just like this team is it's not working. If you Kev uh, Kilban, if you look at the uh, Cyprus team, I mean, like geez, we'd 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 love it now in many respects. You've Duff on the left. <laughs> you I'm not sure actually who was where. You might remember were you in central midfield that night? But it, the midfield is Duff, McGeady, Kilban, Stephen Ireland, who was then playing exceptional football for Manchester City, and you've Clinton Morrison and Robbie Keane up front. I mean, it's incredibly yeah. attacking as well. We had enough. We had enough, didn't we? Certainly to to, to win that game. I honestly, it was. I, I look back and it was. I think it's many consider it one of the one of the worst, if not the worst, result in our history. And it was to be part of the team that night was was awful. It was it was a, a terrible night. But I do, and I've said this to you many times when we've been on. I, I honestly feel that 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 result brought the team so close together. We 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 did have pullouts from the squad after that match. And lads didn't want to be around the squad. And I felt that the lads that stayed on, the lads that played and went through it going into the Czech Republic game back at Lansdowne on that uh, Wednesday evening, I felt as though that we got a lot of credit within internally. I, I got a lot. Of, I, I took a lot from that game because I felt as though that I've got lads behind me there that, you know, would go through it and would take anything on the chin after that because it's what Kevin's touching on there. I think it was Miss Piggy. I think there was it was a Muppet that was at the training ground trying to get in on a pitch with Stan. And it was it was just a terrible time to be around the side. It was yeah. it was the worst that I've ever, ever, ever experienced. I, and I don't think we'd ever experienced as, as a squad during my time, what, from about 97 when I first got into the squad, leading up to that to that moment, uh, we'd never experienced any sort of real negativity like that. We'd had bad spells, of course, around Saipan and yeah. all these sort of things that had come about. But that was, everything was just on us, the, the, you know, newspapers on us, everything. It was it was a bad time. I mean, as much as you, you try not to read it, it's in your face, isn't it? You, you've seen it around the hotel when you're walking around. You, you've seen it, and it, it was just a dreadful time to be even going out to training. You were trying to keep your head down, getting off the bus to go out and training when you're supposed to be fixing things and trying to get things right going into the next match. It was just, it was a dreadful atmosphere. But I felt as though that everyone that played in that Czech Republic game you know, showed some balls because that was that was an awful week leading into that Czech Republic match after that Cyprus game. Yeah, and and Kev, to follow up on that, like it's 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 terribly sad the way it went because Steve Staunton, as everybody knows, was just such an exceptional player, like a legendary player for Ireland, yeah. and and his managerial era, obviously the more recent one, and, and probably sticks in the memory for a lot of people. And it finished even that uh, at Crow Park with a one-all draw with uh, Cyprus. Steve Finnan yeah. scored an equaliser late on, but there were boos at full time. You know, Steve Stone yeah. the end of the campaign, uh, boos. I think Kevin Doyle mentioned Bobby Robson, which was it's a big pity. Obviously, very sad that his health uh, deserted him as well, and and yeah. a pity for Staunton. It might have been great for him to have Robson to bounce off. Like, to what extent was he struggling? To to what extent can you put it all at his door, Kev, from memory? <sighs> Yeah, I don't think. Well, I, I think everyone has to, to take the blame. And I think Bobby Robson was was a huge uh, a huge miss for him because Bobby was brought in just obviously to try and uh, uh, try and bridge that gap of his inexperience to try and help out with, with everything. And obviously, Bobby's health health deteriorated um, so dramatically around that 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 time. So we obviously had Kevin McDonald, who was a very good coach, who who was working with at, the, at that time. There wasn't. In fairness, around preparation for the games, there wasn't too, there wasn't too much. It wasn't too different from anything yeah. that we'd done before, or even after. It wasn't when Giovanni Trapattoni came in. He didn't do anything that was so dramatically different that you know he made us all incredible players. But he he made us just a little bit a little bit tighter. I'd probably say a little bit more organised on the training ground day to day, attention to detail. With trap was you know even the most basic things was we were just we were going through the most basic routines mm. for half an hour an hour at a time and things with, with trap we were doing a lot of shape work and things like this constantly with trap and that was from the early stages in the week so maybe that's maybe something different but I think in terms of 
the preparation, what he did. He didn't do anything so differently, and he, he didn't necessarily have, or, or he didn't have control over the side. He, he had control over us all. It just didn't work out. And I say that Cyprus result just clouded the whole the whole era. That yeah. that was exactly what happened. And I think that put a downer on on us all as players. Certainly, everyone that was following the team at that side, and certainly the media as well. It just it was just one. It was just one negative environment all round, I think, and that's that's basically that was caused by that Cyprus game. John, I'm sure even over in uh, the UK and, and talking to family or just what, observing the media, you could feel the atmosphere around the team, especially around that kind of Cyprus into Wales at Crow Park period. Yeah, it was extremely negative. I think it was uh, after the after the Cyprus game. I think we we have Czech, Repo- Czech Republic at home, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, I always remember uh, Paul McShane. Paul played that game. I think it might have been Paul's first start, uh, his debut game. And I remember the impact Paul had as well of just really it kind of kind of lifted everyone before that game. The type of character he is. And I remember before, even before the, the, the you know, small light-hearted moment before the Cyprus game, Paul Paul was absolutely flying into tackles and crunching. Whether it be Duffer, Robbie, and uh, the two lads, obviously we were at Manchester United at the time. And Paul, the two lads had come to me and were like, "Hey, John, you're going to have to tell Paul to relax." Like this was the day before the game, you know. But Paul trained how he played, and rightly so, and that that got him into the team, you know. And he, he had a fantastic game then uh, that that Wednesday night at Lansdowne. Mm. Um, but it, it it was I can imagine as you were talking about Stan. The stand the player like an incredible, incredible figurehead leader on the team on the pitch, and he tried to he tried to get everyone nice and relaxed about it. And what Kevin uh, just touched upon there with the difference with Trapattoni, obviously would have been the experience side of things, and that's what obviously Stan was hoping, bringing Sir Bobby in and having them uh, Kev McDonald with him as well, that they were going to be able to help. But Trapattoni had that real experience of whether it be tournament football, club football the little details as he always spoke about, the set pieces where he used to absolutely lose his mind for five, ten minutes in the training before the games. That was the only time he used to lose it when the boys were, were when we were practicing our set pieces because mm. he re- he realised they were so important and he, he'd always say, hey, look, I've lost finals over this. I've lost the UEFA final. I've lost the whatever final. These are the details you need to get right. If we do, we'll have success. They won't remember he, he, they, they remember the scoreline, he said. They won't remember the performance. And that was definitely true with Trapattoni's uh, era. Yeah. It's true and it's also not true. Like, I do remember the Trapattoni performances as well, you know? I mean, it was... Um, there, uh, I, 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 I accept the point. You probably do, ultimately. You get to the Euros, you remember the uh, results and the success. But, like, it's not like anyone no, yeah. harks, harks back and says, oh, wasn't it great when Seamus Coleman was left at home in 2012 and Wes Hoolan couldn't get near the side as well, you know? No, exactly. Look, Trapattoni was brought in, and his his remit obviously was get this team to qualify. And yeah, that was that was that was the manager style, and that's what he stuck to, and that's what he felt was best for us. And when you're given a manager that experience, the job, you 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 take on board what he's saying. He, mm. you, you you take on board his opinions, and they were his opinions at the time, and plenty disagreed. And that's that, that's the beauty of it. Because Kevin Doyle, looking at these uh, Staunton teams, even the two I've in front of me from the Cyprus game and even the Wales game at home, it's uh, like definitely more of an attacking slant than what Trap brought. Yeah, um, we were still like in, I suppose, still in the area of four four two, and you yeah. always played two strikers, and, and that's how. So looking back now, it looks very attacking. It was probably pretty standard for most teams around around Europe at the time, you know, two out and out centre forwards, that's what we always played, apart from that Wales game where we, we just, when Stan took over, actually, he, he fiddled a bit with 4-3-3 and he sort of wanted to, I think, go that route, but um, maybe it didn't suit Robbie or, and, and there was a few of us on the scene, a few strikers, so it was easier to get the two in, but um, yeah, it didn't, at the time, I never thought we've got a real attacking team, I don't think anyone on, you know, at the time, was talking about how attacking we are. It was just mm. looking back now. If you look at any team, four four two two strikers, you think, "Geez, that's attacking." It's just not normal nowadays to see that. Yeah. Okay. Fair point. So it was kind of standard at the time, and yeah, nothing too adventurous. I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> strong squad, though. The world, our squad, fantastic. I remember coming into that squad. 
because they'd most of that most of that squad had been, or a lot of them when I first got in, had been in the, at the World Cup in two thousand and two, and they were still like a lot of that team were, you know, I was in awe of all of them were, you know, superstars. Damien Duff had just won the Premier League, I think, with Chelsea. Yeah. Uh, Robbie Keane was fantastic, obviously top class striker. So you go through our team, uh, Richard Dunners, you know, yeah. Shea Given and Gold. We had we had a fantastic squad, all playing at the all at the sort of peak of I suppose of their careers. I was. At, you no, know, heading towards the peak of my career, we were all. Um, John was winning the Premier League with Man United. Mm. We were all flying it. So we, when you look at that now, that squad we had it was top class. That's probably why. You know, that is why everyone at the time was so disappointed. I suppose why we got so much stick, why we weren't. You know, we're looking at it now, thinking, "Geez, third wasn't too bad." And that was a strong group but at the time. That squad was, you know, playing. All those players were playing regularly in the Premier League. I'd imagine if you go through the team. Yeah, so when you look back, you look back at it differently to what. To what actually was the case um, at that time? Yeah, even on for that Wales game yesterday, thirteen years ago, like Ian Hart's on the bench because you've got John O'Shea and you've got uh, Steve Finnan, you know, peak of their powers. Yeah, so that's a strength and depth that we we don't seem to quite have at the moment. Kev, do you remember to round the, round this up? Do you remember the end of that campaign, that Cyprus game, the one-all draw and the booze at the end? Yeah, we got outplayed against Cyprus again. Cyprus had a way of playing against us. They, Kevin's touched on systems. M- most international sides and every side you would have played against would have been 4-4-2, 4-4-1-1. That's certainly how we played. But Cyprus played with two wingers. They played with two high and wide lads. I remember I remember playing the game. I would have been playing the left-hand side, I think, in the Cyprus game but uh, of midfield. And they, they, they just they, they tinker with the system and, and we probably weren't prepared for it. Certainly in the first game, we should have been prepared for it in the second game. And they had a way of playing where they had a lot of flexibility in the side and they went out and just played with expression. And that was maybe something different than we'd experienced maybe international football. If, you know, you, you mentioned, I know I was joking with you early on saying about it, was, it wasn't necessarily a great game to watch. <laughs> a lot of international football, you watch it even now, a lot yeah. of international football games, they, they, they cancel each other out, the team. Sides play the same way. It's almost like you, you, you go against your man, man for man, stop your man, and everything else will, will be fine. It, you know, it, it, it might take a moment of magic from one particular uh, class play you've got in your side that changes the game. International football, I think, it, even then, was pretty much the same as that. But Cyprus played a different system, and we got outplayed, and we, we were lucky to get a draw. We, yeah. we, we managed just to hold on. Stevie, if you say, Stevie Finnan scored a, quite a lucky goal. I think it was a set piece, and he broke to Stevie, and... Steve, he put it away, and we and we came off to quite rightly got booed. It was mm. just a bad time, and that that whole campaign, as you say, you look back and finish third. But we felt even ourselves with the caliber of players that we had throughout that squad, not just the, the starting eleven. We had a, we had a good squad, a good core of probably 25, 30 players that that could have come in. We could have interchanged any position. We would have got a, a, an equally a good performance from from whoever came into the side. So that was the disappointing thing, and and to to cap that. Or to finish that uh, campaign off with that really, it, that was a poor performance. It was as bad a performance as probably we played out there in Cyprus. It's just that maybe we managed to contain them a little bit because I remember they had a few big chances, Cyprus, in that game to put the game to bed. It just never happened. And mm. we were quite fortunate to get a draw. So, yeah, it, it, it finished on a sour note. It, it just, it, everything about that whole campaign was, was poor in my mind. There's not too many ne- uh, positives at all, to, uh, at all to take from it, apart from that we managed to get to play that one game at Crow Park. Yeah. Well, that first game. The first game, yeah, and then I mean, I mean, that's not without even mentioning the Stephen Ireland granny situation, and just you know, like quite a few things just seem to. I, do, I just go remember, wrong. I just remember Slovakia for that reason, the Kevin Doyle's left foot shot that stuck in the top corner because I was stood right behind him, so I'd never seen Kevin Doyle even strike a ball with his left foot. So to see him do that that night, that was just uh, that was incredible. So that's the only thing that I remember from the Slovakia game. I don't remember anything else that happened after it. Mm. Was a John O'Shea assist as well, Shazy. Was it? <laughs> yes, Kev, yeah. <laughs> it was a brilliant was strike. It, it, was, it, I was at a clearance. I'm not sure. Oh, sorry, an assist, yeah. <laughs> it looked like you were going nowhere, actually, Kevin. I don't know how well you remember it, but you were sort of drifting across the goal and it looked like you'd even do well to wrap your foot around yeah. at the angle you were at to the goal. Yeah, I know Kev. Kev is killing me there, saying he never sees me. Actually, my left, I'm not left foot, but I've scored a couple of stingers. <laughs> I have... Um, <laughs> Two two goals of the year for Ireland were both my left foot. So there you go. Um, two swingers from long distance. Um, but that one, yeah, I was going nowhere. I look back at that. I've seen that goal a good few times since, and I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have been shooting my body position, everything the yeah. way I was hitting it. I don't know how I. Um, I don't know. I'm not bragging around, but I don't. I don't know how how it. It must have took a little bobble before I connected with it or something to to make it 
zing through the air like that. But yeah, they went and equalised in the last minute. They anyway, did, 90 yeah. minutes. <laughs> Do you know, I, I say it, Kevin, with that, with that game as well, that probably summed up the campaign because I, I honestly yeah. I remember playing that game in Slovakia. We controlled that game. We didn't have any problems. We saw any sort of uh, threat through uh, through the entirety of the game. Obviously, Kevin scored a, a worldy goal in the match. I just felt as though we, we, we probably should have gone on and got a second or a third goal in the game. And then we were caught with a sucker punch late on that. That summed up the campaign, I think, in many respects, mm. that we just couldn't see that game through. And it was it was just a, a campaign of, of negatives. And that was probably another big negative that night in Slovakia. I know what happened afterwards wasn't great as well. But I think in general, we controlled that match and it just wasn't mm. to be. That, that whole campaign was a write-off, really, yeah. John, I meant to ask you, on the Wales game, which was yesterday uh, in 2007, I'm just seeing, you know, you almost, um, you wouldn't notice, Gareth Bale was on that Wales yeah. team. He must have been very young. They must have been 17, 18 then. Was he, was he good that day? I can't remember, because he might have been down your side. Yeah, he was. He was down my side. No, we kept, thankfully, we kept him fairly quiet. He was, uh, he was nowhere near the Gareth Bale, obviously, that um, he, he developed into, but you could see he had, certain attributes that were that he obviously developed as well he was obviously doing quite well for Southampton I think at the time and uh, but no we managed to we managed to keep him quiet but um, no look at that Wales game it, it was obviously important we won the game and it's, it's, it's crazy to think of the, what was Stevie Ireland's record for Ireland was it 14 caps and 7 goals or something? Something like that, yeah. Because he'd, he'd scored the, in, like, the winner against San Marino. He'd scored against Slovakia before Kevin Doyle scored the second. He obviously scored the winner that Wales game. And like it's a it's a brilliant goal as well. You know, the, to jog people's yeah. memory, Robbie Keane plays it into him. But I mean, shows a bit of pace, takes it around the keeper, stays calm, tight angle, slots it away, doing brilliant things for Manchester City. It, it's such a pity he didn't fulfil the obvious yeah, promise, John. He was, he was exceptional. Big shame. Big shame, but I think, uh, look, Stevie only has himself to blame, I think, on that one. Would you have known him around Manchester at the time? Would you have tried to pull him for a chat here and there? No, not not particularly. Um, Any time I was in the squad with him, I got on got on fine with him, got on good, good with him. So there was never um, never never any issues there. Um, but it was just strange, obviously, what developed and sad because when you see those kind of numbers and you think of obviously the type of style of player he was. He was suited to international football as well, scoring the goals like that. And to lose a, a player like that at the time where you're talking about the peak of his powers was, would have been a blow to everyone as well. Mm. Yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, to wrap this up, by the way, uh, Damien Duff had a quote in The Examiner where he was talking about this Wales game at Croker. He said it was just another game. He said it was obviously beautiful playing at Croker. Uh, the size of it, the fans there. But he said, for me, it still couldn't beat Lansdowne Road. Fans on top of you, north-south terraces. So he says, yeah, it was nice to play at Croker, but nothing, not even the new Aviva, will beat the old Lansdowne atmosphere. And anyone that's been to the three, I'm sure, would agree. Kevin Kilban, old Lansdowne, is that the number one there? Yeah, old Lansdowne was, it was the only ground I wanted to play at as a kid. You know, I all wanted to do as a kid was play at Lansdowne and score at Lansdowne. So managed to do that. So that was, that. honestly, it, it I, I always remember when, when, when I hear things like that from what, from what Damien's saying. We had a, a player at Sunderland with us called Stefan Swartz, good midfielder for Sweden. And Stefan, as you say to me, oh, he said, do you still play in that shit hall in Dublin, that, that stadium? <laughs> and and we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, he goes, the train's going underneath. He said, what's that all about? He said, but I tell you, we couldn't get a result there. Everybody hated playing at Lansdowne. And that was it, really. It was it was our home and, and nobody nobody came into, into Lansdowne and left with with an easy ride and that's the way it always was it was just a, it was a fabulous atmosphere when, when that when that place was was hot it was certainly hot yeah it was great it was our shithole <laughs> yeah is that, is that the way to describe it yeah, yeah. <laughs> where were you in that, in that did you, did you, you would have got a few games Kevin at old Lansdowne wouldn't you yeah I scored yeah. my first international goal at Lansdowne um, I always remember the old the smell in the dressing room it was like this old DPE type <laughs> <laughs> Thinking smell. I loved it. It was it sort of like switched on your sense. It was like yeah. like being a kid back in the dressing room again. It was that <laughs> you know, it was old wooden seats in the dressing room. It was just an old and I probably moaned about it at the time when I was there and gave out about it. But looking back that to me was you know, that was my uh um, biting memory and I smile on my face now. I, I, I loved it again. You know, I looked past all that. That was where I went to see my first games of first games of football was in the old Lansdowne Road. I went I saw the lads play there, I think. Um, a couple of times before I got into the, the squad myself and yeah that was um, 
You know, it was to, that to me is my childhood memory of watching Ireland play there, watching on TV, being there itself. That yeah. that triggers a love of of football for me. Yeah, it's great. The new Aviva, fantastic stadium, as good as anywhere you can play. Um, and nice, as as a nice to play in Crow Park, but yeah, it's the old lads for me. And the, the younger lads now would laugh at that, I'm sure. But us, us three haven't played there. I don't know. It gives it that all nostalgia feeling, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, John, do you want to make an argument for the new Aviva over the old Lansdowne? Yeah, just just a little bit, just a little bit. I would I would argue, obviously, that Lansdowne would have had a bit more soul, a bit more soul to it. But the Aviva, the night when you. You, the atmosphere it can create. You think of the Germany game when Longy scores. It can and it will have more special nights to come. The Aviva. Um, it's it's an amazing uh, arena to be to be playing your football in. And yeah, London had, had a bit more. London had obviously a bit more show to it. But um, maybe Ooh, the phones just not helping us out there. But I think he was making a bit of an argument for Aviva but I think about to say mm. Lansdowne was where it was at well listen lads um, thanks so much John O'Shea thank you I think the line has just dropped and to uh, Kevin Doyle and it's Kevin Cavan thanks a million 13 years ago thanks yesterday it was Crow Park and now it's self-isolation for I don't know how long I presume Kevin the horses are just rest up do nothing uh, that's the plan yeah in fairness for me I'm lucky you know still going out feeding the horses doing everything it's it's apart from the kids are at home <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably spending more time outside with the horses now than I normally would, to be honest with you. But apart from the kids being at home, it's when you're out in the countryside and you've got animals, it's every day sort of the same, to be honest with you. I'm lucky, very lucky to have that because I can't imagine what it'd be like to be cooped up at home every day. But um, no, they're, they're fine, enjoying the sunny weather. Good man, good to hear it. Well, listen, thanks so much for your time and for taking the time, Kevin Doyle. Thank you. And Kevin Kilban. Thanks, Joe. apologise for saying it wasn't a great game. I, I, I'll, I'll watch it again for you and I'll report back. How about that? No, it's nothing. It's Joe, you don't have to apologise. I, I, I'm just, as I said before, I'm just going on history of knowing you when you just throw these things out. You've read it in an article or something, so you think you can put it out when you've not actually watched oh, the game yourself. No. Joe, watch, watch a sporting event sometimes, Joe. They get you. Honestly, that's all I'll say to you. Honestly. Listen, you rest up there. Take it easy. Stay safe. I will do. You too. Take it easy. Good all luck right. to everybody. Good man. See you. Bye-bye.